Do not attempt to flee again. Computer, move full impulse into that nebula cloud. I can still see you. You know, I had something for this very occasion that I got from a Ferengi, and of course I left it downstairs in my bedroom pod. Attempts to bribe me will only be added to your list of charges. Don't say it, Shelby. Less talk, more action, Admiral. Until next time I present to no one the next episode, Angel One. We start with Picard dropping his log. They found a Federation freighter, the Odin, lost seven years ago to asteroid impact. And that's pathetic. Simple deflector shields should have sorted that out. Regardless, a few escape pods were missing, suggesting survivors. They enter orbit around the nearest Class M planet, Angel One, a planet similar in tech to mid-20th century Earth. Riker has a moment where he exposits, for no sake but for the audience, that the pods would have taken five months to get there. Data gives a more specific estimate, and Riker thanks him dismissively. But really, there's no difference in what they were doing in-universe. They were both blabbering about nothing and Riker's impatience feels a little hypocritical. Data describes the planet as a constitutional oligarchy run by six women with an elected headwoman, a matriarchy. This pleases Troy, and Worf, who likes strong women. Picard defers to Troy for initial communication with the planet. They are answered by Beata, the elected head, who feigns no civility in blowing the Federation off. Troy asks for permission to search for survivors of the Odin, and it's begrudgingly granted for a short period of time. Beata hangs up abruptly, and everyone looks offendedly nonplus. The lighting and framing in this episode's shots rivals more cinematic efforts. I love it. Riker and the away team beam down to Angel One with the severed head of one of the Daft Punk guys. Apparently, it's not just a matriarchy, but an oppressive one. Women are larger than men. They are the leaders, and essentially subjugate the males. Their leader, Beata, looks like half of my ex-girlfriends, so I'm already sold that she's a bitch. Troy wants the survivors, and the Angel Oneers act suspicious about this, while projecting the feds can't be trusted and may be lying. About what? You seem like you know what they're talking about. It elicits extreme reactions every time. Calling them sus for wanting survivors makes you seem like you're hiding something. You executed the survivors by Snoo Snoo, didn't you? It's okay. We could all only be so lucky. Riker Street asks if the survivors are there, and Beata refuses to answer. You can also notice that a lot of women in the background are wearing thick-soled shoes to give them another couple of inches. The team is sent to a waiting quarters where Riker addresses the Angel Wonder's paranoia. Data asks what to do if they deny the survivors exist, and Riker says, let's not look for problems. He isn't. Data only wants to plan for one of two primary potential outcomes. Goddamn, Riker, think with the other head for once. Meanwhile, on the Enterprise, Picard informs Worf, but really the audience, that a Romulan battlecruiser is in the neutral zone along one of their borders. Picard wants to warp over for insurance, but can't with the away team down on Angel 1. Picard's a brave man. Those Romulan guys were fucking scary. But I am only in a shuttle. Picard is then hit by an errant snowball that looks like it was made from a shaved ice machine, but it's from Wesley's snowball fight on the holodeck. One, close the doors, boys. And two, are we still confused about if things can leave the holodeck or not? Red Block died, but Picard stays wet. And don't say, oh, lighter compounds are fully easier to recreate than full-size humans because they will interact and kiss and screw more complex life forms. <laughs> There's just no rhyme or reason or rule to it, at least yet. Picard and Worf also smell an odd odor on the boys. But who cares about that? Back on the planet, Data discovers perfume his unfamiliarity of which is understandable. I totally get that he wasn't programmed to know what that was. But then he says he doesn't understand the term aphrodisiac. And didn't he say he was pre-programmed with all the sex moves? Home dude made sure you were a functioning walking Kama Sutra, but you don't know the term aphrodisiac? I call bullshit. The team meets with Beata again, and she says they've been permitted to take the survivors. The Odin had four of them, all male, led by a man named Ramsey. They're fugitives on this planet and have been hiding for nearly seven years without any trace. That's also slightly unbelievable, but I can live with it. Back on the ship, Wes and his playmate from earlier are both in sickbay with respiratory infections. 
The doctor is trying to figure it out, but only has transmission by contact ruled out. Picard rubs his neck, so he either is infected or is just stretching it out from a long day on the bridge. Could go either way at this point. Back on the planet, Data wants to find material unique to the Odin crew that they won't find naturally on Angel One to help them track the survivors sniffer dog style. Riker asks for the use of a library, and Beata continues being a sexist bitch whose only purpose in life is to make herself feel superior by demeaning others for the chromosomes they were born with. Fucking chromo Karen. Back on the ship, because the pacing is rushed as fuck. Worf says they need to scan for platinum. So I'm assuming in the library they discovered that the planet doesn't have any. And they're just assuming the Odin crew does. I guess. There's no guarantee the survivors kept anything on their persons. And their pods are probably in an evidence vault somewhere. Back on the planet, Riker is given local garb to adorn for a meeting with Beata. Yar and Troy are shocked and slightly offended for Riker, who seems surprised by their reactions. And so do I. If the point of this episode is to shine a light on male treatment of women through ham-fisted role reversal, then why have the women of the main cast seem so adversarial to the other women? It's all confusing, and I feel as if I'm getting conflicting messages from the half-baked writing. Back on the ship, dude, guys, pace this out better. Let shit breathe. Like Picard can't, cause yup, he's infected. The doctor says he's not fit to run the ship, and okay lady, he's just shivering a little. He's well enough to snap at you for saying that dumb shit. But she orders him to bed. Picard gives command to Geordi, who definitely has never got to sit in the chair before, and he properly soaks it up. Worf is sick too, by the way, but he finds traces of platinum on the planet. He asks to notify the away team, and Geordi commands, Make it so. Back with Riker, he models the hottest male fashion on Angel One. Yar giggles and calls it sexy. Her protest earlier and giddiness now are both so cringe. Look, I'm stuck in space, so can only assume this character and actress has her fans, but I am far from one of them. Riker goes to meet with B. Arthur, and a crazy woman, you can tell by her hair being slightly unkempt, says Riker's full of it. There's an expiration date of giving a shit about survivors, and it expired a year ago or something. It's made known that the crazy one is the mouthpiece of the minority that supposedly didn't trust the Enterprise and didn't want to allow them to search for survivors. With her gone though, the golden girl wants to bang Riker. Riker uses his communication badge, comm badge thing, to tell Yar to go ahead and find the Odin crew without him. He'll be caught up in diplomatic paperwork for hours. Yar and Data set phasers to stun, and then request to be beamed to the place they found the platinum. Her arms are crossed when they beam away, but down when arriving. Now I'm confused about beaming, too. They were beamed directly into the Odin encampment, in an open chasm, with people, objects, flames, and a bloody lamp, in the open, under no camouflage. How are y'all never found again? And hey, is that MacGyver? Makes sense, because only he could have an electric lamp working for seven years off the grid. Lex Luger says he's been expecting the away team, but forget that for now. Back on the ship, the virus is spreading, and where's your cure for everything medicine now, Doctor? Why are a fourth of these episodes so far revolving around space diseases? Jesus, really wish that Lagonian didn't steal all my meds. We pan in on Geordi's nose hairs, and the interim commander sends Worf to sickbay. Then cut back to the away team. Blondo, who is expecting them, asks how they found him. When he learns they searched for platinum, he admits it's from his pilot wings he kept for sentimental value. So again, really lucky he even had that on him. Regardless, he doesn't seem to want to be rescued. He says he and his men took wives, had kids. This is their home now. Back with Riker, Beata says Ramsey is an anarchist, and they were afraid the feds would support the Odin's cause against them. She also says men have it easy, and live life just enjoying it like pets while they make life work. Even though we've already seen the males treated more like servants, she says Riker attracts her like no other man ever has, probably because he's over five foot tall and actually speaks. They kiss, and he says she better respect him in the morning. He is a cheeseball horn dog. This guy's really gonna fuck his way through the galaxy while space diseases are literally everywhere. Her servant boy comes in, though, with the chrome head of Destro that Riker beamed down with. It's a gift he brought, an Albanian meditation crystal. The boy looks so dashed to see Riker with his master, but he is dismissed, and Riker gets into some interspecies relations. Back with the team, 
Ramsey says five months in the pod was like an eternity, and dude, I've been up here for over ten months. Six of that was literally in a Cardassian prison. Don't be a bitch. He says when they got to the planet, it was like heaven. Strong, tall, lovely women. But the treatment and social position of men was criminal. He says he wants to stay, and they can't make him leave. Which data backs up. He says the freighter wasn't a starship. But Picard said it was a Federation freighter, so yeah, the rules still apply. It's not like the Navy doesn't have authority over its vessels that aren't carriers. Back on the ship. Once again, just choked with sick people everywhere. The doctor says hundreds are infected, and the virus mutates every 20 minutes. Oh, y'all dead. Until then, though, Geordi is worried about meeting the Romulans so understaffed. One third of the crew is down, and more Romulans are showing up. Dun dun dun. The Atlantis is following our warp stream and gaining quickly. How long until she's in tractor range? Five seconds. Slam the brakes on her again. She'll just follow us again. I have an idea, but we'll have to wait for her to circle back. Back with the away team. Yar says she'll leave the Odinites alone, but asks Ramsey how he knew they were coming, which he won't answer. So the team beams away, and out steps the crazy woman, Ariel. She's not crazy. She's protecting her husband, Ramsey. She told him they were coming, and that's why her hair is slightly wild. She lives outdoors. The team, now back at the capital, bursts into Beata's private quarters, and thank God everyone's wearing clothes. This could have been awkward. Yar informs Riker of the Odinites' refusal to leave, and Beata sentences the Odinites and wives to death. Why? And why now? Stakes. Moving on, we hop back to the Enterprise. It feels like the editor played leapfrog with the scenes, but I know it's the writer's fault for the story being so loose it requires it. The doctor visits Picard and notices the odd scent on him. She realizes the virus is airborne now, and wow, doctor. It's amazing you haven't thought of this by now. Back with Riker. Back in uniform. And I'm not trying to be mean. We are all human here, but Riker has gained 30 pounds in his gut since the pilot episode. They are getting ready to leave when Beata rushes in to make sure they know she captured the Odinites. She's no fool and followed Ariel going to warn her husband. And again, how has this not been done yet? And why does Ariel look like Ambassador Delenn from Babylon 5? Riker goes to reason with Beata, and yeah, he totally has a pot belly now. And since we're playing this game, he looks like that Freaks guy from Beyond Belief just without a beard. He has to meet with Ramsey one more time to convince him to leave, and she agrees. The team go to Ramsey and his people, couples with kids, waiting to die. The team says they can all go with them. But the wish version of Starbuck over here, without a second thought or any conference with anyone else, says, Nope, we'd rather fucking die. Riker wants to force them to come, but even as marooned ex-fed pats, apparently that would violate the Prime Directive and other regs. I hope we don't have a more famous episode down the line that ignores us and just moves the native people after Wesley's insurrection. That would be insulting to the audience after dealing with this episode. A bit oddly specific, I know. Riker says he'd rather face court-martial than leave these people to death. But up on the ship, the virus is out of control, and the doctor won't allow anyone up. Riker then says the dumb line, Will the virus affect Data? And the doctor gives the equally stupid answer, Not likely. Data beams up to get to the neutral zone, but now all sorts of clocks are ticking. The next morning, the team declines an invite to the executions, and Data hits up Riker, saying he never left because he calculated he still has time to make it to the Romulans. The doctor is rushing to make an inoculation, so Riker and co. go to the execution after all, which is apparently done with some kind of atomizer. Beata calls this compassion, but I call it terrifying. Riker gives a long speech, boiling down to, if you do this, you'll make them martyrs, which works enough for the executions to be stayed for a one-minute debate. While they do that, Data tells Riker the doctor just happened to make the meds just in time. How convenient. Riker says lock on to everyone, but stand by. And the Gal Council returns. They decided to let the group live in exile, far away. So basically, just go back to how things were. You know as soon as the crew leaves, she's going to kill the Odinites anyways. For all her talk about benevolence, she still wants to hold men down and fears their clever nature. The away team returns to the ship. They share the same needle. 
and warp away to fend off multiple Romulan ships by themselves with a captain who can't speak his orders for a sore throat. Godspeed! I hated this episode. It wasn't fun, it wasn't funny, and at all times I felt my intelligence insulted by the laziest writing I've seen in the show so far that definitely failed to not seem tone deaf in its message. Real Time Angel One, originally airing January 25th, 1998 holds a unique place in the hearts of fans. While not considered among the series' finest hours, it remains an intriguing exploration of gender roles and diplomacy, wrapped in the trappings of classic trick storytelling. Behind the scenes, its creation was marked by both challenges and creativity. The episode emerged from a desire to explore social and political themes within the framework of a planet where women held societal dominance. Inspired by contemporary debates on gender equality and power dynamics, the writers attempted to craft a narrative that would challenge both the characters and the audience to reconsider their assumptions. The script was penned by Patrick Perry, and the writing process involved numerous revisions and discussions to ensure that the episode's message was clear, without sacrificing the trademark blend of adventure and philosophy that defined Star Trek. Casting presented its own set of challenges, particularly in finding actors capable of embodying the inhabitants of the society portrayed in the episode. Makeup and costume design played a crucial role in bringing these characters to life, with the production team working diligently to strike a balance between otherworldly and relatable. The visual elements were instrumental in establishing the ambience of the story's setting. The planet was realized through rocky landscapes and semi-futuristic architecture. Meanwhile, the use of practical effects enhanced the episode's sense of scale and immersion, showcasing the technical prowess of the production crew. Filming presented its own set of logistic hurdles, and the episode's director, Michael Rhodes, worked closely with the cast and crew to realize the script's vision, while trying to maintain the pacing and tone expected of a Star Trek episode. Upon airing, Angel One received a mixed response from audiences and critics alike. Some praised its thought-provoking themes and strong character moments, while others criticized its god-awful pacing and misguided execution. While not without its flaws, it remains a compelling example of the series' commitment to exploring the human condition through the lens of science fiction. From its inception to its final edit, the episode embodies the spirit of exploration and discovery that defines the Star Trek franchise. No speech. Lock tractor beam. Computer. Picard maneuver. Again, under the Atlantis' belly. This is foolproof. I saw it in a movie once. 